Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you are tuning in. Welcome to Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs. I'm Emma from Misfit Gardening and this is our last episode for 2020. I can't believe next week is going to be the new year. Um, So today I wanted to talk about some classic winter storage crops that you can grow in 2021 and try boosting your self-sufficiency from your garden this year Um, without really needing to bust out the canner. I know a lot of you had issues with trying to get hold of canners or jars or lids, all of those things that you need to preserve um, your harvest safely with canning. Um, So I figured that actually setting aside some space from your garden in 2021 to grow some of these classic winter storage crops um, is going to be really beneficial for a lot of you. So let's dig in and learn a bit more about classic winter storage crops. Just as a reminder, um, for those of you that have been listening to the podcast for a little bit, or even if you're brand new, um, I want to try something new. So in an upcoming episode in early 2021, um, I want to um, do a reader shout out and I want to um, read and share what types of vegetables you guys recommend for new gardeners because there's so many people that are now tuning into this podcast and I want them to get help from you know you you guys right you you listeners you know you're all part of this you know bigger misfit gardening community and um, being able to help another gardener who's just trying to get started out with what varieties they should go is a really great um, resource for a new gardener think about you know if you yourself um, you know have been gardening a while think about how you started to garden was it a recommendation of a variety from a friend or a family member that you started with or was it an old-time favorite that you read somewhere so I want to know from you guys what your favorite vegetable varieties to grow are and why and to do that I want you to head over to uh, the Instagram and I'll pop a link into um, the description of this podcast so you can um, pop onto my my profile there on Instagram and drop me a message like send me a DM with what your favorite variety to grow is and why and I'm going to read them out I'm going to read them out in an upcoming episode so um, if you want to have your story shared then DM me on Instagram. All right, let's get stuck in and talk about some some classic winter storage crops, right? Because they go hand in hand with a victory garden. And, you know, it's something, especially in the UK, it's something that we would always plant every year. And I think a lot of it was because it was you know, handed down with that mindset of a victory garden and providing food security in uncertain times. Like I might, you know, my grandparents grew up during the war. They grew up with rations. They grew up growing food in their back garden because that's what was done Um, and I've just kind of inherited a lot of that that's kind of how I was brought up so I always try to find space to grow some of these vegetables in my garden maybe not all of them um, but definitely some some of them so um, winter storage crops are you know very very popular especially in Europe and you know lots of summer vegetables and fruits need some sort of processing or processing um I'm my accent's starting to go already I think um but we need some sort of processing of our summer vegetables to store them for enjoyment over over winter so think like um canning peaches in syrup or making tomato sauce and salsa okay that there is those are a couple of preserving methods that come to mind Um, but winter storage crops on the other hand are vegetables nuts grains even fruits that can be kept throughout the winter months without additional preserving steps so you know you don't need to can them 
You don't need to freeze them, you don't need to dehydrate them or get fancy with one of those freeze drying machines, okay? Um, and crops that are traditionally stored over winter in this way, um, and I say traditionally like, you know, European traditions, um, but there are usually things like root vegetables, hard shelled squashes, um, head forming crops, so there are things like those tight cabbages, nuts, seeds and grains. Okay, so there's, there's quite a variety there that you can grow um, without the need for those additional preserving steps, um, which is great if you're a busy homesteader. And it's really great if you've, you know, not got a lot of um, space for things like a canner, right? Because, you know, those those things do take up quite a bit of space. But there, there are some nuances to um, overwintering and storing some of these crops. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about why we should grow winter storage crops. Well, th they can really cut back on the amount of stress um, that canning season can can bring. Um, can can bring. Um, you know, you don't need to be hauling out the canner right every night after work to preserve that evening. You know, that evening's harvest, or or even worse, let it rot and go to waste. Okay, um, it, it's it's you know a bit of a time saver in that regard okay like canning season can be stressful like for real it can be stressful and if you've got a lot of stuff going on um you know i can't tell you the number of times i would get home from work late and i'm looking at these two you know massive stainless steel bowls full of tomatoes that need to get used and and canning was just the last thing that I wanted to do. I don't want to be up until midnight trying to get all of that sorted out. So so I get it. Um, also, you know, using these winter storage crops, it kind of stops having that, you know, trying to figure out, like, what to do with all those pickles. I mean, have you ever, you know, just canned a bunch of stuff, like canned a bunch of pickles, for example, um, because that's all you could think to do with them? And now you're left with like, I don't know, 40 cans of pickles that you've got to get to. Like that that might have been um, a situation we were in. Like I made so many bread and butter pickles one year and I got the recipe wrong. Um, I, I actually ended up adding too much salt um, just because I wasn't um, paying attention when I was doing the canning. And I mean, the the pickles and stuff they're, they're fine you just have to wash them really um heavily because they're very very salty um and you know we're I mean they're still sat there on the shelf and I think at this point I just need to toss them um you know put them in the compost or something and then you know clean out the jars but you know it's it's it can be difficult for a lot of people and homesteaders and that's something that nobody really talks about it's like what do you do with like 30 cans of chutney like what what do i do with all of these pickles right um so so it, it does solve that issue right having storage crops that you don't have to can save some of those problems um but crops you know like i mentioned have some basic storage requirements right so if you're growing these these um overwinter crops so they're root vegetables hard shelled squashes um head farming crops think cabbage um nuts seeds and grains okay they've, they've got some basic storage requirements so if you've got a basement um a garage or a shed uh, or even a window well for your basement or a room that's kept cool then you can leverage those spaces to store your harvest um, in mild winter areas like in the uk some of these crops can be kept in the ground and harvested fresh out of the garden um you know throughout winter that was kind of one of the cool things um when i lived in the uk and i had my allotment like we would go and take the dogs for a walk and we would walk to um, the allotment and we would be harvesting stuff for Christmas dinner on Christmas morning, which was really nice. Like get a bit of exercise in, um, you know, after you've had a, a couple of, um, 
you know, books fizzes in the morning, you know, just, just walk on down to the, to the allotment, um, dig up my leeks, you know, harvest a cabbage, maybe get some potatoes, then walk back and, you know, get on with Christmas dinner. That was kind of one of the fun things. So enough of me kind of nattering on about, you know, some of those things. Let's talk about what some of those winter storage crops actually are. So you can take advantage of this, this winter and really start planning your garden to include some of these crops to enjoy throughout um, next season. Okay. Now my first one is garlic and garlic is such an underrated um, vegetable to grow. It's pretty trouble free um it's really easy to grow like we've not bought store garlic in oh my gosh five years now um because we've always grown it um and it's a great winter storage crop to try in your garden because you just plant the individual cloves in fall and leave them in the ground over winter um or you can plant them in very early spring as soon as the ground can be worked and then um harvest in you know early to mid July. Um, garlic's really, really easy to plant. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I just kind of put in the garden and then, you know, cover with mulch and kind of forget about it. Um, you know, occasionally I'll, I'll feed it during the growing season. Um, but really you're just looking for it in summer to start going yellow and the leaves drooping. And then you just pull your garlic, let it dry um, or cure in a cool dry location and that helps those papery layers to form and then all you need to do after that is uh, either cut the leaves and roots and you know uh, either braid um, the leaves together and hang it up in a cool dry location or you can just cut those leaves off and leave you know an inch of of stem there and we just keep ours in a basket in the basement and like I said we've we've never you know, had to buy it from the grocery store. Um, there's lots of different varieties to try. Um, and there's lots of, um, great resources about growing garlic. I wrote a blog post about growing garlic. Um, so I will link that in the show notes as well. So you've got a resource to check out. Next up is onions. Okay. And onions need a long growing season to reach maturity. So make sure that you choose a variety that's going to suit your climate. So you've got long day onions, which tend to do best in Northern climates while short day onion types do better in uh, Southern zones. Um, make sure that you cure your onions after lifting them and then you can braid them and hang them or cut the leaves and store them in mesh bags. Um, there's lots of different varieties of onions. Um, you know, some are things like a list Craig, um, Weathersfield Red, Stuttgarter, Texas Early and Walla Walla are some very popular ones. Um, but again, going to do need to do a little bit of research and figure out which type of onions are going to grow better in your region. But onions are, you know, definitely a classic winter storage crop. And as I mentioned in a previous episode, onions are one of those things that I don't grow here um, in my garden because we get through so many of them. And although onions grow very well here in Utah, there's lots of um, onion farms near near where I live. Um, it's just, I, I mean, I, I don't have enough space to, to grow the amount of onions that we would actually get through in a year. Um, something that we do grow when I can get hold of them and, um, you know, I, I plan them into the garden rotation is shallots. Um, shallots are something that I definitely grew up uh, eating quite a lot of because my grandparents used to grow them um, and they used to pick them up from the store and shallots are um, very very highly sought after by you know fancy chefs and foodies alike um, it's basically grown and stored like an onion but they're smaller they're kind of more tapered they've got this sort of pointy look and they grow in clumps, um, but they grow very well, very easily. And um, the way that my grandparents used to use them is to make pickled onions in malt vinegar. And that's one of my favorites. And I love to try and recreate those recipes from my childhood of, you know, pickled onions in malt vinegar. And, oh, the malt vinegar on your fish and chips. Like, that, that was... That was the treat for us is, is a pickled onion um, with fish and chips and that malt vinegar. 
and some salt on your fish and chips. So I always try to make space for um, shallots. Um, French red is a common one that I grow. There's also um, grey gazelle. Um, that's that's a nice one that a lot of people um, grow. Shallots are becoming a lot more easier to get hold of um, here in the US. So if you take a look through you know, your favorite seed supplier in the catalog, um, take a look and see if they do shallots. Um, it might be a little bit late to be getting those, um, sets or the seeds at this point. Um, normally if you're growing shallots, just like onions, you can grow them from sets, which is a small kind of baby version, um, of an onion or a shallot. And they're usually available around, um, end of August, September through to early October. Um, but they disappear very quickly. So if you see them, um, snap them up because again, in, in a lot of areas, you plant them out in the fall, cover them with a lot of mulch, and then they'll grow on through the winter. If you live somewhere where you have like very heavy clay soil, um, onions and shallots and even garlic actually do have a tendency to rot in the ground um so if you've got somewhere that's not got very good um drainage then consider growing them into um containers instead um that's that's also a good option for you okay number four is celeriac and it's not um very widely known here in the u.s um i've seen it in a couple of the uh, fancier grocery stores, um, but it's it's definitely not one that's very, very well known. So it's also known as celery root. And it's this kind of weird, warty looking um, root veg with like a weird amount of like tentacle roots <laughs> at the bottom. Um, it's very popular vegetable in Europe. Um, but like I said, it's not very well known here. It tastes like celery. Um, and despite its really rather ugly appearance, it's very versatile in the kitchen and stores well in a cool, moist location. Like celeriac can be used, I mean, celeriac chips um, or fries was a popular one. So you would kind of cut peel the celeriac, cut it into kind of fry sized pieces, like think steak cut fries or chips, and then, um, you know, bake them with a little bit of olive oil or pop them in the air fryer. And then um, we always had them with like a squeeze of, of lemon and a little bit of salt on them. They were pretty good. Um, I've had people mash them, add them to the mashed potato. We actually like to use celeriac in soups and stews and, um, you know, it's, it lasts a lot longer in the fridge than what normal celery does. And the, the key thing about celeriac is it needs a long time to grow and you have to start the seeds early, just like you would with um, celery. So you'd be looking to start the seeds around January for a lot of us in the northern climates. And then you lift the celery, um, celery root in fall before the first hard frost. Then you've got to trim off those leafy tops, um, which are great if you've got chickens or rabbits. You know, you can give them to those or just pop them in the in the composter. Um, and then you just kind of store them with the soil and the roots intact still. And that's going to help um, keep those a lot longer. So, you know, pop them in a perforated bag in the fridge or pack them in damp sand and in a sealed container like a lidded bucket or one of those big storage totes somewhere cool and dark. And that's going to help keep that root nice and firm. It's not going to go soft and, and squidgy and go bad. Um, I'm starting to see a lot more varieties of celeriac become available um, through the seed catalogs. Giant Prague was a common one that was available, but now there's a few more that seem to be coming through, like Prince, Mars, and Talus. Um, there's there's a few that are coming. So if you're looking for something that's new, um, exciting, kind of exciting, um, and stores very well, then consider celeriac um, in your garden for next year. Number five is Swedes, uh, also known as rutabaga. And these are a member of the cabbage family. And uh, rutabagas are not very often found in grocery stores here in America, but they are in every single supermarket in England. And they're huge in England. Um, 
like the way that my family always had them was we mashed them with carrots um, as a side for a Sunday roast. But there's other ways to enjoy eating them. And there's lots of recipes that are available. Um, we had a friend who put rutabagas in mashed potatoes, which was a really interesting um you know thing on on the plate because it kind of took away some of that heaviness of mashed potatoes and it had a you know this kind of interesting you know sweet earthy kind of flavor to it so um you know there are definitely some cool ways to to use rutabagas and um, they are a long season crop and they do need more than 90 days to reach full maturity but here's the thing um they can handle um, a couple of light frosts um, but they can't take a hard freeze like we get here in the US so they're often started in summer um, as seeds so start the seeds indoors and then transplant out um, for harvesting in fall um, or you can start them in early spring and then let them grow all summer um, you want to be lifting those rutabagas and trimming those leafy tops and the tap roots to about an inch before storing them and that you want to store these um, root vegetables in cool moist conditions like the packed damp sand put them in a sealed container and store somewhere cool and dark there's there's a lot of different um swede varieties that are coming available here in the u.s for a long time all i ever saw was american purple top but now um you know there's ken's family there's joan um gill feather major dune or major don um i grow joan and major don um and i've also grown the american purple top um i'm going to be growing the ken's family um in 2021 so i'm quite excited um to be growing something a little bit new but you know don't overlook um you know swedes or rutabagas for your kitchen as well as in the plot um they're definitely um a good you know vegetable to have um and the, you know they they help um bulk out things a little bit so um we'll often use uh swedes and rutabagas in like a roasted root veg um kind of thing maybe with some parsnips and carrots even beets um you know sometimes you'll have a rutabaga that's kind of got that kind of hot peppery kind of taste like a turnip um but other times they can be very sweet um so they can add an element of interest to to the kitchen all right, let's talk about potatoes. It would not be um, a discussion about classic winter storage crops if we didn't mention the humble spud. Um, potatoes are obviously easy to grow in small spaces, um, bags, containers, as well as in the ground. Um, no victory garden would be complete without a crop of potatoes, that is for sure. Um, there's different varieties that last longer in storage than others. So things like baby or new potatoes have very thin skins and they don't last for long-term storage. That's why, um, especially if you're in the UK, you know that you know early early spring is when you get those you know baby new potatoes coming in from jersey and uh, they're a, a seasonal treat to to enjoy um but you can also grow them yourself um but if you're wanting ones that are going to be for storage then you want those main crop or late season spuds think like russets those last a lot longer but you want to keep the potato tubers in the ground at least two weeks after the foliage has died back to allow the skins to set and you want to stop water in that area so they'll dry out and start forming a good set um, you will need to protect the ground from freezing and then dig up the potatoes and allow those skins to air dry for a day somewhere protected and out of the rain you don't really want to wash the dirt off the potatoes or put wet uh, potatoes into storage because they're going to go bad quickly so having them dry off is very important um, and you want to store those potatoes in mesh bags or crates um, a vented box even a paper sack um, and keep them somewhere that's cool dark and moist so some good varieties are things like uh, Burbank, um, Kennebec, Elba, Yukon Gold, Red Norland, all those kind of main crop varieties um, will do well 
in the storage and uh, if you look at a lot of the um, the catalogs online um, especially if you get ones that are catering more um, to you know large production and um, you know farming growers you'll see that they include things like storage um, days or approximate months in storage and stuff like that so it's worth looking into um, a little bit more before you buy your potatoes um, so you can figure out what varieties you're going to want to um, you know dedicate some time and resource into growing all right let's talk about number seven and beets Beets are one of those crops that help to bridge that hungry gap. So that gap between winter and late spring, right, when there's not a lot coming out of the garden. They grow very quickly in the right conditions and often are ready to harvest in about 55 to 65 days. Um, obviously, you can use beets as the greens on the top in salads and the roots as well. And you want to be really lifting beets um, before the first hard frost of the season uh, in fall and you don't want to be leaving them um, too long because if they're bigger than three inches in diameter they get woody and not very good um, you know if you're going to be storing them you want to trim the tops to about a quarter of an inch um, uh, and then cut the taproot off just before storing. Um, the best way to store them is actually to pack them in damp sand in a sealed container um, and store them somewhere cool and dark because that's going to help keep the moisture in the root and stop it going like soft and squidgy and, and weird. Um, beets actually do very well like lifting them in fall and storing them in this way and um, that's actually how uh, commercial seed growers um, who live in cold climates handle their beets and then they will plant them out again um, they won't necessarily cut off the taproot if they're going to be planting them out for seed production um, but they they will plant them back out in in spring um, to then harvest the seed which I thought was really fascinating and when um I was told that during one of the interviews that I did with Giving Ground Seeds, um, Julie was a great resource of, of knowledge and that was one of the things that she shared in that podcast. Um, so listen into that podcast if you're interested um, in how um, small scale seed growers actually grow seeds for things. Um, but beets, again, you know, people either love them or hate them. And a lot of the time people's, um, you know, I guess like first try of beets is pickled beets and I mean there's there's been a couple of good pickled beets that I've had um but not not a lot but one of our favorite ways to use beets in the kitchen is to roast them with some honey and um, then use them in a cold salad so you chill them after you've roasted them and then um, kind of make a, a sort of sweet um, you know kind of salad dressing for them maybe add in you know some baby kale or something and then some uh, good quality goat cheese um, they're very very good like that and um, I've never had anybody complain about eating beets um, you know when I've made them in in that salad um, maybe a couple of complaints afterwards because they've eaten too many beets and um, they've kind of worried about what happened in the bathroom um, but some great varieties to try are things like Shiraz, uh, Chioggia, which is like a candy cane stripe variety. It's an Italian variety. Uh, Touchstone Gold is a beautiful yellow variety. And then some really great um, go-tos that a lot of people grow are Bull's Blood and Detroit Dark Red. Let's talk about sweet potatoes next. Um, sweet potatoes need a long, warm growing season. Um, so if you're in the UK, this will probably be something that you'd want to put in the greenhouse. Um, but they do both edible tubers that grow underground and edible leaves. And I know maybe some of you listening from the UK are like, wait, what? You can eat the leaves? And it's true. Like a lot of uh, my Asian friends are 
always asking me to um, harvest the the leaves from the sweet potatoes because they they cook them and use them in a variety of different dishes. Um, so if you're curious, uh, take a look online for some recipes of sweet potato leaves. Um, but here's the thing about sweet potatoes, right? The tubers do need to be dug out of the ground and you need to be careful not to skewer them with your garden fork because uh, you're kind of going to ruin them. But you need them to be harvested on a dry day and then they've got to air dry for two weeks indoors um, with good ventilation uh, to help cure those skins and then after you've cured them you can brush off the dirt and store them in paper bags and they do store very very well um, but they do need to be kept warm around warm ish around 55 to 60 degrees fahrenheit and that's 12 to 15 degrees celsius um they can be a little bit hit and miss to grow in the garden. They do like a lot of nutrition um, in that soil. So it's very important that you, um, you know, amend the growing space where you're going to be growing sweet potatoes. And they need that long time to grow and actually provide a decent crop. Um, so you need them you know, in the ground early, right after the first frost, but you do need to protect them from that cold weather. Um, if you have a cold snap, um, they are not going to do very well. And that's kind of what happened to us this year was, you know, our sweet potato slips arrived late because I actually wanted to try some different varieties this year. And I wasn't able to get them out in time. So I missed a, like three, almost four weeks um, of growing and they just didn't do very well. And we had a very cool um, spring as well and they just didn't pick up um, and grow. I think we had a very measly harvest of maybe two or three very small potatoes. They were like four inches big. Um, and that, that was all just because of the plant timing. So if you're in southern states, you will probably have better luck. If you're in northern states, then maybe take a look at growing them um, in a container somewhere where you can keep them, um, you know, frost free for a bit and then get them out. They are easy to um, produce the slips from sweet potato that you've bought uh, from the grocery store if you get an organic one especially and there's lots of videos in how to um, make them produce the slips that you can then grow all right number um my own number seven number six eight maybe um <laughs> turnips a very uh classic winter storage vegetable and it's definitely a victory garden staple um and a children's book classic for for real um for those of you that are not familiar um the there is a book called the enormous turnip which is a, a children's book in england um and it might be an inspiration for your young gardeners as well so take a look for that um i may have bought it to um to read to various um you know children family members that we have um it's a fun book but um, we're not here to talk about books. We're here to talk about uh, winter storage vegetables. So turnips um, can get to whatever size that you really prefer them to be. Um, some people like them small, like beets. You know, don't let them get bigger than uh, two or three inches because they'll get um, woody. Other people prefer the bigger ones to use in the kitchen. So just, just try and see how you prefer them. Most of the time in the grocery store, I see turnips and they are like two or three inches um, in size. Um, but what you want to be doing is you want to harvest them um, ideally after a light frost because that's going to help them sweeten up a little bit. Um, you want to trim those tops to about a quarter of an inch trim that tap root just before stirring. And you want to be stirring this somewhere cool and moist like the damp uh, sand in a sealed container somewhere cool and dark and that's going to help keep that moisture in the root and help you know stop it going wrinkly and gross um purple top milan is a good um variety to to try tokyo market is also very popular and it's got these uh white roots um they're popular in salads as well as kind of roasting um so there's a couple for you that you can try all right parsnips oh my gosh parsnips are one of my favorite and we grew some 
ginormous parsnips like I've never seen parsnips this size they were absolutely huge um and I should I should um oh my gosh I should find the photo and put it up on on Instagram um but they they were huge and they're sweet and uh parsnips I mean if you're into home brewing um parsnips in fall make a pretty good uh, homemade wine um, because they become really sweet after a frost and um, they're perfect for roasting as a side dish um, or you know using in a variety of different ways in the kitchen um, but parsnips need a long growing season and need to be planted out in early spring um, and they take a long time to germinate too and the thing with parsnips is the seeds uh, rapidly lose their ability to germinate so parsnip seeds you want to be getting each year really um, because that's that's the best uh, germination rate and it rapidly drops off after uh, two years. So you want them to um, have you know plenty of space to grow and a cool tip that I learned as a kid was when you sowed your parsnips sow um, some radishes there as well because the radishes will um, grow in very quickly and you can see where you you know sowed your parsnip seeds and you can be harvesting your radishes whilst your parsnips are getting established and um, to store them very much like all the other roots you want to trim the tops to about a quarter of an inch um pack them into damp sand in a sealed container keep them somewhere cool and dark um you want to try and keep as much of the tap root as possible that's going to really help keep those parsnips a lot better and uh, some great varieties to try very common is the half long guernsey and hollow crown um, and also the all american variety carrots are also part of the same family as parsnips and larger carrots last a lot longer in storage and are usually planted later in the season and then lifted in fall before the first hard freeze um, and in mild areas, carrots can even be grown over winter and are so sweet that they're like candy. Um, so if you're wanting something to grow over winter, carrots might be uh, up there on the top of your list. Um, storing carrots, carrots need that cool moist condition. Um, so trim those tops to a quarter of an inch and then pack them into damp sand and put them somewhere cool and dark. Um, you want to keep carrots well away from apples because apples can cause the carrots to go bad in storage did you know that i didn't know that um but that is um something to be very mindful of especially if you are looking at creating like a little window well root cellar kind of deal um on your suburban homestead um put your apples somewhere else um some good varieties of carrots um are things like danvers ox hearts um Bolero, Naval F1, that's a hybrid variety. Um, there's some good ones to, to start with um, and there are some very good storage carrots. All right, now we mentioned up at the beginning about winter squash um, as being a very common um, variety, well, very common plant to grow. Now, there's a couple of things about squash varieties. There's actually three varieties or um, species of, of squash. You have the pepos, the cucurbita pepo, which include things like acorn squash, um, Halloween pumpkins, sugar pumpkins, delicatas, and spaghetti squash. And they store for the least amount of time. And then you've got Curcubita maxima. And those are things like Hubbard squash, uh, buttercups, um, turban squashes. And they keep about three to four months. Um, there's another variety, um, a gyrospermia or a gyrosperma um, and they have the long lasting kusha squashes and those can keep for like six months and then finally there's the muschatas um, which are things like um, your butternut squashes um, those big cheese pumpkins um, those long island cheese pumpkins I believe is a muschata um, the seminole pumpkins I think are also muschata family of squashes 
and they keep for about four to six months depending on the variety so the more common ones are uh, Kirky Bitter Pepo, the Kirky Bitter Maxima and then the Kirky Bitter Muschata the um, Gyrosperma family so those Kushos are not as popular but I'm seeing a lot more of them um, coming in now um, so if you're wanting to have winter squashes throughout all of winter then you definitely want to be planning the right type of squash for your garden that's going to last um, so a lot of gardeners will grow you know a couple of plants of each variety to ensure that they've got plenty growing so you want to be cutting those fruits from the vines carefully curing them in the sun for about a week or cure indoors in a warm room uh, with good ventilation and want to carefully turn those squashes over frequently and um, so all parts of that skin can be exposed to the air to cure and then just store them in shelves or in sturdy crates in a, in a cool area you know about 50 to 60 degrees fahrenheit or 10 to 15 degrees celsius in a dry room and some good varieties to try are those uh, sweet meat oregon homestead that's a maxima variety uh, waltham butternut mosquito provence uh, province uh, those are the muschatas uh, table queen um, that is a pepo variety um, amish pie and blue hubbard those are a maxima variety um, but there are ones that are very um, often recommended um, to try in the kitchen okay now i've got two root varieties or root crops uh, sorry that you may not have heard of here in the u.s one is salsify and the other is scorzonera and um, they're two different crops but they're very similar in growing and in storage they're pretty common in uh, europe um they're like a an old um like medieval root um vegetable that is, was grown really um, and they're a perennial crop that keeps coming back year after year and they're better harvested after a frost um, and you can keep them in the ground under plenty of mulch if you don't have like a solid freeze in a you know a real northern part of the US um, but if you want to you can lift them in fall trim those tops to a quarter of an inch and then pack them into damp sand um, or and a sealed container and store them somewhere cool and dark and you want to keep as much of the taproot as you can to help the roots keep better they've got a kind of an interesting flavor some people say that they don't really taste of anything other people um, think that the taste is a little bit like oysters um, we just like to add them into like gratins and things like that um they're definitely a staple in our garden because it keeps growing and coming back year after year um we've not used them as much in the kitchen um, but that's definitely something that we're going to be changing next year. We're going to be um, pulling up a lot of them and eating a lot more because they've kind of taken over one of our garden beds um, with the blackberry canes in there. So, you know, it's it's kind of cool. You can also use the uh, salsa fee. Um, as like a very early lettuce because it comes in very early in spring um, and the leaves are edible um, duplex russian giant um, is a easy to get hold of variety of scores on her, um, and salsify the sandwich island mammoth is a popular one as well all right let's talk about the heading crops which is cabbage and there's lots of late season cabbages that can actually be kept in the ground over winter in a mild area um, and it's those late season cabbages that store better whereas the early varieties of cabbage make the best sauerkraut like the most delicious most tender sauerkraut is those early varieties of cabbage um, but you know late season varieties are things like winter savoy uh, brunswick um, that premium late flat dutch january king um, storage number four those those late season cabbages um, are great for winter um, you know in the uk we just had our cabbages out in the ground over winter sometimes if if we remember um you know you maybe put some row cover on them 
but most of the time we didn't um whereas you know if you're in somewhere like pacific northwest you probably want to put a little bit of row cover on them um and if you're in the colder areas um of the u.s then you will want to harvest them and store them so to store cabbages you harvest those firm heads and you want to store them with some of those outer tougher leaves um and you want to keep it somewhere cool and moist and you want to check them regularly and remove those spoiling leaves um just you know take off those outer leaves okay drying beans let's talk about drying beans um soup beans um they can be climbing beans or pole beans but they can also be compact bush beans um beans are one of those plants that you sow right after um the first frost has passed and you know you can sow a number of different beans um and you probably should sow a, a lot more um, beans, especially if you're wanting them for drying, because you need to leave those pods on the plant until they become dry to harvest them as soup beans. And, um, you know, if you have been gardening for a little bit, then you know that one of the common things is that you want to keep harvesting um plants especially things like beans because it encourages more flowers and more flowers mean more beans so you know if you're harvesting your beans for green beans um you know and you forget a couple and um you know they start drying out on the plant then your production of the plant goes down um you're not getting as many whereas if you're growing drying beans you definitely want to plant a lot more bean plants so that all of those beans that are forming on there dry out and then you've got a decent supply of um, soup beans. Um, you want to be shelling those beans from the pods before the frost and you want to allow them to dry a bit more indoors and then you can store them in paper bags, glass jars, plastic containers, like whatever you want. But some um, really good varieties of those uh, white marrow fat beans um the good mother starlet maypole and black valentine black valentine's a really good one um for drying beans now i did mention fruit and so far i've not really talked about fruit um apples and pears are very common like winter storage uh fruits there's so many ver different varieties and some have got longer storage times than others um if you can stock up on varieties known to store well from a local orchard great if you can grow your own uh, as a fruit tree in your backyard then even better um you know being able to add fresh fruit to your winter storage crops is a smart food uh, a smart move um and it's great that you don't need to you know can them all but you want to be looking for unbruised fruit and uh, you know one of the more common ways to store them was wrapping them in newspaper in shallow boxes or crates somewhere that's cool and moist remember keep them away from your carrots um, especially apples apples give off um ethylene gas which actually makes other uh, vegetables and fruits ripen faster which decreases um, shelf life so for apples you want to be thinking things like uh, macintosh red cox's orange pippin uh, arkansas black golden russets for pears things like bosque and commis and conference are good storage varieties um kohlrabi um is maybe one of those weird and wonderful vegetables that you've never really heard of um it's part of the brassica family very popular in europe and it's like a, a root or a swollen stem that forms and it's that piece that is eaten um you know saute it with butter and nutmeg is how uh, one of my friends with german heritage likes to enjoy it um but they store very well in perforated bags in cool moist conditions um and they're actually very delicious and i think there's kohlrabi starting to gain a lot more popularity um there used to only be a couple of varieties that were available in the seed catalogs but there's a lot more that are starting to show up and they come in these beautiful um you know green colors and beautiful reds oh my gosh there's some absolutely gorgeous um heirloom varieties um i think there's one called blower speck um and that is this big red um variety but it's got these um interesting like green flashes on it when you cut it so it looks very striking um, let's talk about Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes next. Um, they're a native perennial here of North America and they are so easy to grow. In fact, they're so easy to grow that they can become a weed. Um, so one of the best things you can do 
uh, to stop them you know growing rampant in your garden is to harvest them um in some mild areas you can have them stay in the ground over winter and harvest in earlier than in early spring um but you do run the risk of them sprouting and growing a little bit more so i like to harvest them um after a light frost um and try and get as many out of the ground <laughs> as i can um but for harsh winter areas you definitely want to lift those tubers in fall and if you're concerned about them taking over your garden um harvest them in in fall you want to pack them into damp sand um or in a a couple of bags in the fridge um, and just store them somewhere cool and dark and you know that there are great um, high fiber uh, vegetable to be growing um, they don't call artichokes fartichokes for nothing so for some people um, because of the amount of inulin that they have in there which is a type of um, fiber um, it can cause a lot of people to have um, some digestive issues um, so don't try and eat an entire plate all at once um, start slow and add them into um, dishes uh, here and there um, maybe don't plan to eat a whole plate full of Jerusalem artichokes um, right before your you know big meeting with the boss uh, or anything like that because um, it could could be quite embarrassing for you um, and another one that's uh, you know might make you fat somewhat is more beans um, specifically I, I want to talk about garbanzo beans or chickpeas and uh, chickpeas are a, a staple crop in many parts of the world particularly um india and the middle east and they lend themselves so well in the kitchen um there's so much more than just added to to salads i mean um you're starting to see like chickpea based snacks appearing um in the grocery store and things now and chickpeas are really cool than uh, normal beans because they actually tolerate cooler soil temperatures which means that you can start them earlier than traditional beans um one heads up on growing chickpeas or garbanzo beans is that the the leaves of the plant um contain skin irritants so make sure that you're wearing gloves um for the harvest and if you're touching them um you know make sure that you've got gloves on and when it comes to harvesting them you basically pull up the the whole plant and allow the beans to ripen on the plant before processing and then you just collect the beans that are fully dry um, shelling them by hand and allow them to dry more indoors and you know store them in paper bags or glass jars or even plastic containers um like I said, there's a lot of things that you can use garbanzo beans for in the kitchen. Like if you're, um, you know, partial to Mediterranean food, there's some really great um, baked chickpea recipes with rosemary and lemon, which is delicious. Um, you can add them into minestrone or with pasta. There's just so, so many things that you can do with garbanzo beans. Um, they're just not as, as popular to grow for some reason here. And having a mixture of different types of beans especially ones that you can grow earlier in the garden is quite a smart move especially if you're looking for winter storage crops so i want to know from you what your favorite variety of winter storage crops to grow are um just as a last reminder you know drop me a dm on instagram and let me know what your favorite variety to grow is like what your rock star vegetable is and what you would recommend or what you do recommend for new gardeners to grow year after year something that does so well in your garden i want to know what that variety is and i want to know why you love to grow it and drop me a message you know dm me or a comment on um, instagram and let me know and i'm going to read them all out guys i want to read them out in an up coming episode in 2021 um, in January so you know new listeners and new gardeners that are trying to figure out their garden for 2021 have got a great resource um, that they can use and even people who have got a, a well-established garden and you know how to grow like I want to give people some ideas of something new and exciting that they can try in their garden so that's it for this episode and uh, that's it for 2020 uh, from the Homesteading and Gardening in the Suburbs podcast. I hope that you and yours have a wonderful holiday season and I hope and wish all of you a very happy and prosperous 2021 and I hope that your garden planning goes smoothly over the next couple of weeks 
Until next time, I hope your garden grows beautifully and I'll see you all next week.